Go to Philippians if you would. Philippians chapter 4. You know, when you're going to preach, when you're going to preach through a book, there are, there are some places your attitude is this. I can't wait to get there. I have been waiting for this passage. I think we'll get done tonight. We, we, we just, we just don't know. How many of you, seriously, how many of you, and my hand is up, you have, you have dealt with worry, raise your hand. Welcome to the human race. I mean, there's been a time. I, I read a statement that is bold, but I believe that it's dead on. And it's this. Worry is the ultimate act of rebellion against the rule of God in a believer's life. I want to say that again. Worry is the ultimate act of rebellion against the rule of God in a believer's life. You know, you stop and think, when you worry, what is it that you're saying? I don't trust God. God's not capable. He doesn't pay attention to me. He doesn't love me. He needs my help. You know, what, what, what can we do here? It's, you know, I'm going to work like it's all up to me, and then I'll pray like it's all up to God. That doesn't fly. That just absolutely doesn't fly. There was a man that told a story, true story, uh, of a friend. The guy's name was Herbert Jackson. He was a missionary. And he wound up going to the mission field, and in the mission field, with, with, with this specific mission situation, there was a car that they had to deal with. And with that car, uh, there was a need. You couldn't start it. So the former missionary shows him, now this is what you've got to do. Uh, you, you've got to get into a certain place where you can, you can push it or do whatever. And so this Herbert Jackson, he thought, you know, I, I, I think I know what I need to do. There's a school nearby on the mission field where he's at. So he went and he got the teacher's permission. He got some kids and they pushed the car and got it started. You know how it is, you know, when you, when you had a clutch, all right, you know, turn the key on, dump the clutch and the thing starts up, you hope and pray and you get going. And he found out this is what he could do. He could, he could park somewhere on a hill. And then when he had to go and make calls, he could park on a hill someplace else or he could leave the car running. He did this for two years. Two years. Then there was somebody in his family, I believe it was his wife, that got seriously ill and they had to leave the mission station. So a new missionary comes along and he's going to tell the new missionary, this is how you deal with this car. So he opens the hood and he starts explaining the problem and the new missionary goes, well, Brother Jackson, I think I know the problem. And he reaches over there was a cable that was disconnected from the battery. He tightens it, gets in, cranks it, <laughs> gone. You know, the moral of the story, the power was there all along. You just missed the connection. How often have we missed that connection? Let's go to Philippians 4, and we'll start with verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these 
things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. Somebody said that there are over a hundred diseases in the human body that are attributed to worry. Worry is one of those things that when you get involved in it, there are times that you wind up spiraling down. It, it gets to the point that you can't, it seems like you can't quit. And you can get into a point where you feel like your mind is attacking you. I've been there. Where it's like, I can't get out of this. This is really something. Lord, help me. I believe that Satan loves to attack the view of God. When I say view of God, let me rephrase that. The view about God with God's people. And he absolutely drills. I mean, this is a place where he specializes and he gets incredibly vicious. Incredibly vicious. And there are times when people seem like they can't pull out of it. And they wind up worrying. And the worry just stresses them down. And I rejoice in this. God is good. And he can take any person out of this. I know from experience. Now worry, we can express concern, but those concerns immediately go to the throne of grace. And that's where they need to be. Absolutely where they need to be. Let's go ahead and get started with this. And let's understand that the first thing that Paul tells us here in this passage, in this section of the passage, is this. Rejoice in the Lord always. Always. And again, I say rejoice. What does it mean in the Greek? Exactly what it says. Rejoice. Always. And again, I say rejoice. You know, stop and consider this. Do we rejoice no matter what? You know, we're talking about an election. We're talking about situations. We talk about, you know, situations in our lives, with family, with friends, at work, all these areas. Can we honestly say that, you know what, I can hear the Apostle Paul right now. Rejoice in the Lord always, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. Exactly what I'm going to do. Family situations are hard. There are situations that, I mean, they absolutely press us beyond measure, at least it seems like to us. It really does. You ever been there? I, I, and, and I mean where it keeps you up at night, and the tears come, and you can't stop the tears. And yet, here he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Have you ever been in a situation in your vehicle where you look around, you went someplace, and you get in your vehicle and you go, my soul, where in the world am I? I mean, how do I get back on the freeway? How do I get back in the car? You know, what direction do I take to get home? And then there's that wonderful thing that you maybe have in your car called the GPS, or you've got a smartphone and it's got a map. And you go, I know. I'm going to ask this. And so you punch it in, and you give where you want to go, and it says, and you go, they've got to be kidding me. That does not sound right at all. Now, here we are. We are dealing with worry. There's not just some little thing that's going on. You might see it as a major threat in your life. You might see it as a major turning things over in your life. I mean, it almost feels like you can't touch bottom spiritually. You know how it is when you're swimming and you want to take a break, but the problem is you're far from the shore and you can't feel bottom. You ever been there? And you've either got a float or you're thinking, oh my, I'm going to drown. You heard about those three kids just not too long ago here in our area. They got out of a paddle boat, not one of them had a life preserver on. The grandmother was with them. They got out away from the shore. The wind pushed them about 250 yards away. They got out of it, and none of them had 
None of them had the uh, life vests on. They're gone. They died. They drowned. I mean, that's sad. That's incredibly sad. And now your world is cattywampus. You think of some of the situations that we can wind up being in, in life. And somebody comes along and they suggest something to you, and you say, that doesn't sound right. How can that be? The Apostle Paul comes along and says, you've got challenges? Rejoice in the Lord. Yeah, but wait a minute. No, 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 no. You don't understand. Rejoice in the Lord. Sometimes God is going to give you a command that absolutely sounds contrary to normal human thinking. Listen to that. But he is telling you, get your eyes on God, and not only get your eyes on God, but listen, rejoice. He's running the universe. He created it. He can take care of you. There are times, you know, you do this. I know at least some of you do. Sometimes when you get into your devotions, you stop and you think, wait a minute. I, I, I'm speaking right now to the creator of the universe. Not the governor, not the president of the United States, not some king. I'm talking to God. Not only that, he invited me to that. This is what we mean when we talk about a sovereign God. Folks, he knows the end from the beginning. Has, and again, this is one of those things that we just have to remind ourselves. You've heard me say it before. You've probably heard somebody else say it. Has it ever occurred to you that nothing ever occurs to God? Now, there are times that we wind up going into a situation and we say, Lord, I, I, I didn't want to go this direction. I didn't want to go this direction. Here was, here was Paul Chapel and his wife. They're getting ready to celebrate 30 years of being at Lancaster. They are an incredibly gifted couple. They really are. And 30 years is great. Except here's a challenge. Pastor Chapel's mother-in-law is on hospice care. Just like my wife is getting ready. She's flying out two weeks from today. She's going to see her dad. Her dad will not know her. This is probably going to be the last time she's going to see her dad here on earth. These kind of situations, they wind up coming to us. But Paul Chapel, here his, his mother-in-law is dying. But you know, they're, 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 they've got people that are helping him, and here comes this thing. And then Sunday night, the, the Sunday night they have started this, their grandson is rushed to the hospital, and then he's taken by ambulance to Hollywood, the, the Kaiser Center in Hollywood. His lung has collapsed. He's three years old, folks. He is in incredible pain. They have to put him on unbelievable, unbelievable antibiotics and, and, and pain medication just to keep him from screaming. He gets no sleep. And he comes in. And he's preaching. And then they got to get back to the hospital. You know, and going back and forth. When he was on the call this afternoon, he was at his mother-in-law's house. His wife was taking care of her, again, under hospice care. And they made it through that time. Sometimes you just wonder, Lord, why? And yet the clarion call goes out through the Apostle Paul. Christian, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. What do we do? We do what the Scripture says. We do what the Bible says. Think of it. Go if you would. I, I've got so many notes here that I've written in the site, and maybe you have too, in this passage. It's unreal because the Lord has spoken to so many of us in this place. You've dug into this. Let me give you one passage that ought to be a blessing to us. Go to Romans chapter 8, if you would, please. I'm sure that most of you know this. Sometimes we forget this passage. But this is, this, this is such a blessing. With everything that he has said already in Romans 8, listen to the Apostle Paul in verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, what? 
And then he goes on to make this statement. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not then with him freely give us all things? You know, it's, it's amazing what Paul does here. He starts with the greater to the lesser. He seeks to show the, he seeks to show us if he was willing to die for our sins, if the Father was willing to send the Son to die for our sins, how could he hold back on what we need? What is salvation? I mean, you take this thing of salvation. What's that compared to a flat tire? I mean, th- this is... Look, go back, if you would, to Philippians. Philippians chapter 4. Th- there's two things that we can see here. Our path and our peace. This is what he's giving us. Real, I mean, very plain. Look at verse 6. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. That's our path. Here's our peace. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You want the security and the peace of verse 7? you got to take the path of verse 6. Let, let's, let's break it down. Look again at verse 6. Be careful. In other words, no anxious care. Don't worry. That's what that word means. Be careful. Be anxious for nothing. Literally, listen, not one thing. Now, when I, much less in preaching it, when I, when I study this, I stop and I say, you know, Lord, right now, there are some things that are okay. I mean, nothing major is, is, is on the radar. But that could change tonight. That could change tomorrow. One of these days, it will change because all those that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And the alternative is not to be rebellious against God. Amen? We can't, we don't, we're not going down that path. Faith Baptist will not go down that path. Therefore, one of these days, there's a phone call. One of these days, there's a knock on the door. One of these days, somebody comes and they say something to us that's absolutely devastating. One of these days, it happens. And you know what we remember? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation, your sweet spirit be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Not only is the coming of the Lord soon, but the Lord himself is near. That's what that means. And so, we hear this instruction. You want the peace of verse 7? What you got to do is you got to go through verse 6. Be anxious not for one little thing. You know, there are two two word phrases that absolutely take us out at the knees if we're not careful. They'll take us out at the knees and you know them. Two two word phrases. What if and if only. We look forward, we look to the future and we say, what if? We look to the past and we go, if only. And it nails us. It nails us. And so you know what we do? We start ruminating on that. And it winds up just eating us. And it's like acid. So sad how it takes us. What is worry? The word refers to a troubled state of mind resulting from concern about con- about current or potential difficulties. It actually comes, the word that we use, worry, comes from an old English word that literally meant to strangle. It was the word, it would describe a wolf coming and taking a sheep and locking its jaws around its neck and hanging on until it was done. 
That's literally what worry does for our lives. It'll strangle you physically. It'll strangle you spiritually. There's all kinds of observations. You look it up about worry. Worry is the interest paid on trouble before it falls due. Worry is the interest we pay on tomorrow's troubles. Worry pulls tomorrow's cloud over today's sunshine. Worry gives a small thing a big shadow. Be careful for nothing, not one little thing. Now here's something that I like about this. Because even when I have found myself going down that road in absolute rebellion to the knowledge of God, and I have read this, don't be anxious over one little thing. I know this. I, I, I stop and I consider this. He doesn't want me to do this at all. That means I can trust Him totally. I can trust Him completely. And He gives me the power to do that. Isn't that great? I mean, that, that's you stop and think about that. When He says, don't worry about one thing, what is it? Does, does the Lord want us walking around like this? Yeah, the world's fall apart. I don't care. God's given me some good spiritual medicine. I just quit thinking. He doesn't tell us to quit thinking. He's telling us to think righteously. To think rightly. I just, I can park right there. I can say, thank you, Lord. Except he gives me a little bit more detail. But in everything by, oh, prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Let's, let's kind of take that apart a little bit, could we? When it comes to the challenges of life, when he says everything by prayer, let's stop and consider this. We have every reason to pray. You stop and consider it. You know, why didn't God just kind of put things in motion and we don't have to talk to him at all. We just know he's in control. And he is. He is sovereign. But he allows us to talk to him. And I'm glad for that. I rejoice in that. I have God's ear. You do too. Even though he knows the end from the beginning. We have every reason to pray. Why? Because the Lord deserves our worship. He gave us salvation. He deserves our worship. And not just that, He deserves our adoration. I looked at my wife the other day and said, You know what, honey? You are perfect. Now, I know she's not perfect, but to me, she's perfect. You know, and she loves me even though I'm a slob. You know, I leave clothes hanging around. You know, I just... Any other women here you're married to slobs? Okay, never mind. What's that? <laughs> Ooh, Mason, I wouldn't want to be you tonight at home. <laughs> we must see the greatness of God. That's why, that's one of the reasons why it's so good to go through the Psalms. You know that David went through so much heartache, but as he walked himself through the heartache, he had a, he had a passion for God. He took us, he took us down the trails so that we could hear him. That even at the beginning when he started, he'd go, Lord, why? At the end, he's going, Lord, you don't have to tell me why I trust you. That's great. That's great. I love man, t this. This passage is awesome. Too often, this is what we do, though. See, we go in, Lord, help, and then we give it to Him, and pew, we're gone out the door. Why don't we just stop sometime? See, so you know what, Lord, just like David, I trust you. From everlasting to everlasting, Thou art God. Just read that in my devotion. Just read Psalm ninety. Oh, that is great. 
You know what? We have every reason to pray because he deserves adoration. Because each of us also have specific needs. See, my needs are different than Ed, which is different from Larry, which is different from Dan, which is different from Bruce, which is different from Roger, which is different from Tracy. We've all got needs. And ladies, you too, you, you understand. And so he lets us bring our specific needs. Listen, listen. We all have designer lusts. We learn that from the book of James. There are things that will tempt you that won't tempt me, and vice versa. It's the same with needs. And that's why we can come to God and say, Lord, you know me. Psalm 139 tells, tells, tells me. You know my downsitting and mine uprising. And you know every time I go through this, it's hard. Lord, I need your help. And he hears us, doesn't he, Larry? Isn't that great? He hears us. Now, some, you know, we, we can just kind of park as a local fellowship here, and, and we ought to just all go, thank you, Lord. He knows what's going to go on in the Capitol. Tomorrow, Tuesday, he knows. <laughs> I mean, I, he, he just, he just does. He's God. Supplication is not a matter of carnal energy. You know, Prayer and supplication, you know what that means? I mean, that's an earnest desire. That's a craving. Lord, we need help big time. That's what that's talking about. You absolutely get zealous for God. Romans 15.30 Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. That's exactly what the supplication is talking about. Striving together. Colossians 4.12 Epaphras, which is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers. Laboring fervently. You know, sometimes we just got to get alone with God and the tears flow. And we say, Lord, please, I, I can't leave until I got an answer. I can't do it. Remember I told you I sat down in that chair? And I mean for a half hour I sat there and I said, God, please, you've got to save me from myself. There are times when the anger comes, when the self-centeredness comes. Doesn't it? Guys, especially, it does. You know, we get, here's a Greek term, we get ticked off. Somebody rubs us the wrong way. Somebody really gets to us. I, I've been, I, I've been, and I mean, I sat there, and 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 there, I wanted so much to do something that was not right. Don't worry, I wasn't going to go out and shoot somebody. I might pray that somebody else says, "I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding." But there are times that you feel like you've got it. You know, you, Lord, please help. You know what? This is, this is the way Jesus prayed in the garden. Hebrews 5, 7. This is your Savior, the writer is talking about, folks. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, same word, with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. That was Lord. That was Jesus. There's times that we wind up having to go for that. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, the tough times and the not so tough, but still you need Him. Let your requests be made known unto God. It's worth it to pray because we have so much to thank God for. See, go back to the verse. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. My wife and I were talking about this yesterday or day before yesterday. 
You, you know, we're so blessed. Well, you don't know what I've been through. Let me tell you something. When's the last time you had to live three weeks without any electricity in your house? Have you heard what's going on down in Venezuela? You know, you stop and think about what is taking place. There, you know, there have been over a thousand churches that have been laid flat in China. There were some young people that were just killed recently because they wouldn't be slaves, immoral slaves to ISIS. Christian young ladies. There's another situation where they, where they lowered them in acid. I'm sorry to be graphic, but until their, until their lungs, or excuse me, their organs were eaten up. We haven't been there yet. Like it says in Hebrews 12, ye have not resisted unto blood striving against sin. We've got it good. And it's not just the air conditioning and the indoor plumbing. Thank you, Lord. But Lord, we're ready. Whatever comes. Somebody, Wearsby, Warren Wearsby put it this way. If we have the single mind of Philippians 1, then we can give adoration. If we have the submissive mind of Philippians 2, we can come with supplication. If we have the spiritual mind of Philippians 3, we can show our appreciation. In short order, in, in other words, we must practice Philippians 1, 2, and 3 if we're going to experience the secure mind of Philippians 4. Look at verse 7. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I love this. Get a picture of this. The phrase, shall keep, means keep under guard, stand guard. So here's Paul, he's chained to a Roman soldier. And the Holy Spirit is working with him on how to speak about of this. And he looks at the Roman soldier. And the peace of God, which you, you can't even, it's beyond comprehension. It'll be a guard about you. Not just you in general, but your hearts and your minds. Because, see, we get off in two places. When he mentions the heart, he's talking about wrong feeling. And the mind, wrong thinking. And we're going to stop there. Because I don't want to lose any of this. This is a good passage. How many of you have loved this passage before? Say amen. It's great. You know, I, 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 I don't know what, the, the, like the song that we sing, you know, don't know about tomorrow. But I know who holds my hand. I know who's been there already. And he's a good God. Let's stand for prayer.